start the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, are we okay now? Is this uh, screen? Yes, we are good. All right. So, sorry about the delay from the techniques. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, um, to start with, uh, let me say that um, the issues that were mentioned uh, about the problems in uh, creating an alternative to capitalism have been caused because Muslim economists have accepted <laughs> and critically too much material from capitalist in fact, in fa economics. In fact, the dominant view among Islamic economists is that Islamic economics is just a variety of capitalism with minor modifications to capitalism, you can get to Islamic economics. And this is a major misconception, but it is pretty widespread. And I've actually written a book recently, which uh, is entitled Islamic Economics, the polar opposite of capitalist economics, which explains why this is a mistake. But because of this mistake, uh, Islamic economists have not been able to present uh, a, a viable alternative to capitalism because they think it's just a variety of it. So in this talk, which is 45 minutes, uh, the material I'm going to present is heavily condensed. And I fear that many of the issues that I'm trying to explain will not get, will not be understood very clearly because I'm going to um, just sort of bullet points, point something on which I have articles and books. So uh, if you uh, want to get further information and get more references and more detailed uh, discussions, and then you can join my mailing list, which is uh, listed here. So the central problem that we face in trying to construct an Islamic economics, both the theory and the practice, is that there is a huge amount of disinformation, wrong, false ideas about economics. In fact, and this is not uh, something new, when Keynes was writing his general theory of employment, interest, and money, in the preface he wrote that the, this book, writing this book, required the author to escape from orthodox economic theory because ortho, according to orthodox economic theory, Great Depression could not have happened. So actually the ideas, the basic ideas of Islamic economics are extremely simple and should be obvious. But the problem is that they now appear very difficult because we are trapped within the framework of wrong theories. And these make us make it difficult to understand simple ideas. So why is there so much disinformation about economics? Well, uh, this was pointed out by Karl Marx a long time ago. He said that capitalism works not by forcefully exploiting the laborers, but by uh, making the laborers agree to their exploitation. And how does this happen? Well, it happens by the process of education. Economic theory, as we have been teaching it for the past 70 years and actually a long time more, uh, it tells us that everyone in the system earns their marginal product. Now, this is a technical term, and this is the problem that mathematics and technical terms are used to hide very absurd ideas. And because of the mathematics, people can't understand what, what is really being said. So basically, the theory says that the wage is marginal product of labor, and the rents or interest is the marginal product of capital. And so what is really being said is that both laborer and capitalists get paid fairly. And uh, this is fundamentally a moral argument. So if you present it as a moral argument, you can easily poke holes in it. Uh, even as a mathematical argument, there are many problems. And, and people have uh, explained what these problems are. But because of the disguised moral argument, uh, it's just... Uh, it just continues to deceive people and economic texts will continue to teach this theory and get away with it. Uh, there is a paper of mine called The Battle of, for the Control of Money in which I point out that economics textbooks say that banks do not create money and uh, economists believe that government controls the supply of money and also that 
The supply of money is the main determinant of inflation. All of these three things are wrong. Uh, the Bank of England in 2014 published a paper which says that the standard theories of money creation are wrong, that actually money is created mostly by the commercial banks and banks are not intermediaries. Again, this is a very common misconception that savers put in the money and the banks take this money and loan it to investors. This is also wrong. Actually, banks don't loan money that has been deposited. They create new money which they lend. And also there is no money multiplier in the sense that the government can't really control the amount of money in the economy. But it's not worthwhile here to ex explore uh, these myths of money. We want to go deeper. Why uh, is there so much confusion about money? Well, basically because concealment of the nature and origins of money is very important to high finan finance. High finance has the power to create money at will. They can create arbitrarily large amounts of money. And this power actually led to the Great Depression in 29. And again, um, uh, after 1929, uh, uh, a slew of acts was, were passed which uh, prevented the banking sector from acting irresponsibility, and that prevented uh, banking crises for 50 years. But then in the uh, 1980s, Reagan-Thatcher era started deregulation of financial industry, and this was completed in 1999 and 2000 with a couple of acts which uh, repealed Glass-Steagall and uh, created the shadow banking industry. And only seven years later, the global financial crisis followed, following exactly the same pattern as Great Depression, 1929. So um, this may have flown over um, some of the people who are not uh, detailed, but let me just recap this first part. The economic solutions to our current problems are very simple. They are intuitive, they are easy to understand. If someone hadn't been brainwashed by economic theory, you would be able to see what we need to do. But today, if you at the helms of the policy, uh, the, the theorists, the economists, the policy makers, the bureaucrats, nobody is presenting the, these solutions or acting upon them. Why? Because wrong theories have trapped our minds and they lead to the wrong diagnosis and wrong solutions. Implementing the right theories is difficult because not because the theories, uh, uh, because the solutions are easy, but once you, uh, once you implement the solutions, this will rearrange the power configurations. Basically, it involves empowering the masses and empowering the masses always means taking away the power from the uh, power elites, the, the few people, the, the 20 families and the, uh, the, the few people who are currently running the economy. But by the same token, uh, this implementation will be extremely beneficial for the masses. So if the right knowledge is there, the masses, because of their large numbers, they have the power to create this change. But because they are, as I said earlier, the laborers are willingly agreed to their own exploitation, then there is nothing you can do. But the, the masses understand what is going on and uh, decide that we don't want to play this game, then nobody can stop them. So... Uh, one of the problems is that uh, because of the this false idea that capitalism is uh, is uh, basically Islam, so uh, people say that okay, let's just uh, set the interest rate to zero and we will have an Islamic economy. And this is really a, a very bad uh, uh, idea. Uh, when the whole structure is hugely defective. There is no point in making a small Islamic patch. To give a simple example, we don't want to implement the Hudud ordinance for cutting off the hands when you don't, you're not providing basic justice, you're not providing basic needs, and you're not providing opportunities for all. So if these things are uh, the basic economic justice, then it's permissible to cut off hands. But if, if uh, the economy is highly unjust, then um, then it is not uh, permissible to implement one part of the Islamic, but not to implement wala ala and many other uh, commandments. 
So we can't do piecewise Islamic, uh, Islamization. And uh, today, for example, there's lots of enthusiasm about creating an interest-free economy. And uh, this will cause damage to the Islamic cause because if we just set interest rate to zero and don't do anything else, this will actually cause a collapse of the system. And then people will say, oh, this was due to Islam. So in order to get to the solutions, first we have to unlearn a lot of myths. In fact, there are so many that I can't even count them all. Uh, but I will just go through the major ones. So the first thing to understand is that we must learn to see through the moral foundations of moral economics. And this is difficult because it is concealed and unacknowledged and economists themselves say that this is a positive subject. This is a science. We just study society and we explain what we see. We, are not, we don't have any moral foundations. And uh, the problem is not what they say, but the problem is that the Muslims have been deceived by these arguments. They also believe that economists is, economics is value free, even though this is far from true. So this is part of the bigger myth about social science. Uh, the idea, the, the, actually, it's very, very easy to see if you study the matter a little bit carefully, and many people have seen this, that social science is just lessons about how to build a society which is extracted from the European historical experience. What else can it be? I mean, how do you build a society? How do you run politics? How do you run economics? You learn this by historical experience. So the Europeans had their experiences about building societies, and they took lessons and created social science from them. But the problem is the use of the word science says that this is Everything is fine. Connection is fine. Just, just need to uh, unmute yourself. On Zoom. Uh, That's fine. All right, so now I, um, I, yeah, it's muted. Fine. I got muted, but anyway. All right, so um, I was saying that you can... the, I, the word science is deceptive. And because we are so impressed, rightly so, with physical sciences, you know, the computer I'm using, internet, uh, everything around us, is a creation, uh, is a, a complement of the physical sciences. So there is so, some sorry, justification. You can make, it, you can make it full screen, please. This oh, screen. Yes. That's it. Yes. So um, we are impressed with physical sciences. And this word science borrows the authority of physical science, even though it, it is completely uh, false. Uh, social science is not a science by any means. But once we, are, once we are impressed and once we say that, okay, this is a science just like the physical science and the law of supply and demand is just like this law of gravity, then we start, we accept this as, okay, this is the truth from uh, Europe and uh, we have to use it. So then we start to build our societies according to European patterns. And this is extremely unsuitable. This is the reason, uh, this is one of the reasons for major problems in Islamic societies around the world today. So to under, unravel this, we have to understand how did this social science get started? And basically there was a, over a century of European wars between Catholics and pro Protestants. Uh, before this, uh, social theory was based on the Bible and there was a school of thought, the scholastics, which had developed economics and politics and international relations, everything. But because of this um, century of wars, everybody realized that uh, you cannot base social theory on the Bible. 
Why? Because it just leads to failure. So they said, okay, we have to reject uh, religion, by religion meaning Christianity. And they had to develop new theories of knowledge because they said, okay, if once you reject the Bible, then you have to start building knowledge from scratch. So they developed this theory in which they turned science into the only valid source of knowledge. And they de developed political science uh, on the basis of their experience. Hobbes said that the natural state of human beings is war of all against all because he had experienced this. Uh, in the, everybody was fighting each other continuously for 100 years. So social science was constructed on the basis of rejection of God. There is no God, there is no judgment day, there is no afterlife. That means that man is just another animal. There is no morality except for survival of the fittest. And uh, this world is just a jungle in which there is a cutthroat competition for survival. And this basic worldview underlies all of the modern social sciences, including economics. But this is not acknowledged. So if you want to understand social science, you have to see that social science is the religion which replaced Christianity in Europe. The moral foundations have been concealed. It has the pretense of being value free and it borrows the prestige of physical science. But the reality is very different. If you look at physical science, it has a huge number of accomplishments. So you have computers, you have rocket ships, you have atom bombs and uh, whatever, refrigerators and washing machines and cars, etc., etc., etc. So physical science accomplishments cannot be denied. But social science, what has it accomplished? If you look at the societies in Europe, uh, you have broken families everywhere. More than 50% of children are born to single mothers and they grow up without the love and security of a safe home environment. There's massive social problems because of this. And of course, the search for profits by corporations has led, has led to catastrophe all over the world. The oceans are polluted, the atmosphere is polluted, and the uh, climate scientists say that humanity will not be able to survive on this planet. So this is all the effect of bad social science theories. So we confine ourselves to economics. <laughs> Economists dismissed the warnings of global financial crisis. Uh, Lucas, uh, who was a Nobel laureate in economics, gave the presidential address at American Economics Association in 2003, saying that we have solved the problem of recession prevention. Uh, four years later, he was proven wrong. Uh, Bernanke, who was the head of Federal Reserve, he applied Friedman's diagnosis. Friedman had said, Milton Friedman, that the GFC, the, the, the Great Depression, was caused by a failure of central bank to supply enough money. Uh, so Bernanke turned on the taps and the quantitative easing policies that he followed injected the most, uh, the largest possible amount of money. Uh, it has never been seen before in history. But this could not prevent the global financial crisis and it could not prevent the Great Recession. So the most dominant theories about how the global Great Depression happened are wrong. They are fundamentally wrong. They are easily proven wrong. But the strange thing is that these theories continue to be used to guide policy around the world today. So again, instead of going to technical details, we have to look at why when a theory is known to be wrong, it continues to be used. <clears throat> so to understand this, we have to go deeper and explore why this is so. And this has to do with the power configurations. Uh, when Keynes first understood the major fraud that economists have perpetrated, he was able to see his way partially out of the trap. And the one thing that his theories do, did was create full employment. And this created prosperity for the masses, uh, but it also reduced the wealth share of the top 1%. So counter-revolution against this was plotted and executed. There are a lot of details which are available on how exactly the top 1% uh, 
plotted how to get rid of Keynesian economics and how to implement Chicago economics. And they were very successful in this counter revolution. And today, the monetarists, the Chicago school theories dominate the world and the minds. So the key point is that economic theory is an ideology and it is used to justify capitalism. And economic theory, if you look through the pretense, is basically a, the religion of worship of the nafs. Uh, if you start any economic theory, it starts by saying that your rational behavior is to maximize pleasure in this world, which is obviously just the same as worship of the nafs. And if you trace it back, where did this come from? This comes from Jeremy Bentham's utilitarian philosophy. Jeremy Bentham explicitly rejected Christianity and he said that, okay, after we reject Christianity, how do we build morals? And he said, okay, something which gives you pleasure is good. Something which gives you pain is bad. So the problem is not that they constructed this theory. Obviously, after you reject God, then you should maximize pleasure in this world. What else is there to do? But the mystery is why do Muslim teachers all over the world continue to teach this deadly philosophy and even justify it on the basis of Quran and Hadith? So this results from a defeated mindset. It results from colonization. Colonization is just like the laborer exploitation occurs with the consent of the laborers. So colonization occurs with the consent of the colonized. A handful of Englishmen there was a maximum of 1,000 people in the British bureaucracy. They cannot rule over millions of Indians without their consent. But how is this consent created? It's created by education. And the aim of education is to create a subordinate ruling class, which is loyal to the English. Uh, this class will respect and admire the West and have contempt for their own culture, religion, and history. And the ruling elites the educational process remains exactly the same today. It creates exactly the same respect and admiration for the West and contempt for culture, religion, history. So this has had a massive amount of impact, this colonial heritage, on uh, policies in Pakistan. And I say this as uh, 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 I was head of the PAI and I was, on, uh, I was uh, advising many ministers and uh, ministries about what to do. And I realized that my um, advice is not very welcome because I was trying to give advice on how to bring prosperity to the nation. But the ruling class only want prosperity for themselves. They don't want prosperity for the Nasir. So uh, if you look at examples of radical change, how did China change? Well. You can, uh, you can find lots of books about this, that, and the other. But the basic driving force was Chairman Mao's vision, in which he called the nation to their ancient and glorious heritage. Basically, once you inspire the heart, then all sorts of manifestations uh, occur. So he united the nation on their uh, ancient heritage. In Malaysia, uh, Mahat, uh, there were uh, internal fighting between many different ethnic groups and Mahathir called in the leaders of the groups and united them on a common policy and this was what led to progress. But in Pakistan and India, the effects of the divide and rule strategy continue to divide Muslims and uh, we have fights between Sunnis and Shias and Varelvis and Devandis and uh, uh, all sorts of Yani, all of these created conflicts were deliberately created by the British to divide the Muslims in order to prevent uh, us from uh, rising against them. Even the Hindu-Muslim divide is also a creation of the British. But you see how it's de deadly effects today. So <clears throat> uh, uh, this is the end of part one, that um, the steps for Islamization of economy are natural and intuitive. Modern economic theory is the religion of capitalist societies, but this religion actively prevents us from understanding the real issues facing the economy and prevents solutions. So if we want to learn Islamic economics, we have to unlearn